you. Thank you, Julian. All right, so I think uh, one of the things I think it's really important uh, to, for us to do at the end of the conference is um, to acknowledge uh, Julian and his remarkable effort in bringing us together. Marquetta, Helena, and Julia, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful conference. It has been most, most stimulating. And so in the next 45 minutes or so, um, I want to ask a really hard question. Julian, do we really need a global media literacy research community? <clears throat> I, I, I'm telling you that this question is meaningful to me because my very first experience with the international media literacy research community was before many of you were born in the 1980s in Guelph, Canada, where people from all over the world gathered to talk about media literacy, and I found myself overwhelmed by how incomprehensible it was. I thought I knew what media literacy was until I came to that international conference, and then I realized no, I was just more confused. There were just so many different ways to think about this work that I left feeling like, yikes, I think I know less than when I started. Could it be that there are simply too many differences in our media systems, in our education uh, institutions, in our disciplinary frameworks, in our conceptual understandings, in our normative understanding of the processes of teaching and learning? Could it be that there are just too many differences for us to meaningfully learn from each other and build community? It's possible. In the next 45 minutes, I want to take seriously that idea and invite us to think about what we might do to make a global media literacy research community that lets us leave feeling more connected, more empowered, and more stimulated by possibilities for our own work and our own collaboration with others. So Julian talked a little bit about the Media Education Lab. The slides that I'm using from this talk will be available on here under news and events. So if, uh, if that's useful to you, what we do, our mission is to advance the quality of digital and media literacy education through scholarship and community service, teacher workshops, programs with youth, a graduate certificate program, curriculum development, research, and advocacy and community building. So I like the role of wearing many hats because I feel like that's how I learn best as a learner. I, um, I didn't realize um, until Stuart's talk uh, earlier today that I have abandoned the key concepts of media literacy. Yes, I have. Um, instead, I'd like to share with you my theoretical framework, which is rooted uh, first of all, in the work of John Dewey, who told us that the institutions of education and communication are interconnected in ways that may support democracy. Theoretically, I am also driven by a focus on inquiry learning, believing that people develop intellectual curiosity by asking questions about what they experience in daily life. Theoretically, I am informed by approach to critical pedagogy that says that a cycle of awareness, analysis, and reflection enable people to take action to make society more just and equitable. Theoretically, I am influenced by medium theory, which posits that media and technology are immersive, cultural, political, and economic environments, and that media structures reshape human perception and values. And theoretically, I am aligned with an approach uh, sometimes called active audience theory, the idea that meaning making is variable, that lived experience and social context shape practices of interpretation. I find situating ourselves theoretically to be more useful than the key concepts, in part because of the multidisciplinarity 
that's now becoming normative in the context of, of, of research in higher education. That being said, I guess my real passion is for the idea of expanding the concept of literacy. And I am so delighted that that has been embraced by the European community. You know, 20 years ago, nobody in Europe likes the word literacy. Nobody likes that word literacy. And there were all kinds of other way, uh, reasons why we didn't want to use the word literacy, but now we recognize that literacy is a really powerful word for us to use. And that literacy includes this spiral of practices that start with speaking and listening, that's creating, right? And then move to analysis and accessing ideas and information and reflecting on their significance and their consequences and then doing something as communicators. So this five cycle process for me built in the work of Paulo Freire is really influential and it's really shaped my thinking. I think it's the heart of the simple idea behind media literacy, the simple and powerful idea that unifies us. I also think that we're really unified around the idea of expanding the concept of text. And it's thrilling to see that the mainstream literacy community has embraced our understanding that the word text means any form of symbolic expression that people use to share meaning. After all, that's what literacy is, the sharing of meaning through symbols. And so as we expand the concept of text, we, we naturally get to interrogate all forms of communication and expression. Now there's an expanding variety of approaches and terms, and in this conference we have problematized this, right? We aren't sure what to call it. Do we call it ICT? Do we call it coding? Do we call it youth media? Do we call it digital learning? Do we call it information literacy or media literacy or internet safety? And I'll tell you what I'm thinking about now or what I think this talk is going to try to advance. I think the expanding variety of approaches and terms that we are experiencing is a little bit like flavors of ice cream. You know, I am a chocolate ice cream eater. So, because I've always enjoyed chocolate, I tend to be affiliated with the chocolate family. My eye goes right to that word, second to the bottom, media literacy. <sighs> chocolate. <laughs> but now, because an increasing variety of stakeholders are joining our interests in expanding the concept of literacy and in redefining the concept of text, those folks come from different um, uh, ice cream traditions, right? So our librarian friends, their understanding of expanding the concept of literacy is deeply rooted in the disciplinary tradition they call information literacy, right? And our programming friends who understand that, that the digital tools that we use are built by people, they're constructed. They use the concept coding. It's like that's their strawberry. I don't want to call all the ice cream the same ice cream. I don't want to make everybody like chocolate. I want to respect the fact that depending on our stakeholder position, our disciplinary identity, we're going to use different terms that reflect our own experiences and we shouldn't be threatened or afraid of that we should embrace that we should see that as a sign that this movement is growing rooted in these two big ideas that literacy is expanding and the concept of text is expanding in ways that has lots of possibility for children young people and all of us so it's also the case that because there are these new stakeholders that there are a, a variety of reasons why people care about this stuff. We don't all come to this enterprise passionate about exactly the same thing. In fact, it's the diversity of motivations that appeal to us that is creating some of the momentum in the field and also potentially factionalizing or ghettoizing or fragmenting the field, and this is a danger that I want to, to reflect on with you. For instance, many Europeans, I would say, fall into the category of watchdogs, 
or tastemakers. We've talked about tastemakers a lot over the last two days in relation to the film education tradition. Those of us who are interested in making sure that every child understands the important legacy of film as an art form, of the beauty and integrity of combining image language and sound in moving image media as a, as a powerful art form, actively wanting students to appreciate culturally important media, not just in film, but in history, art, literature, sciences, that's a very important value for some people in our community. Others of us are more aligned as watchdogs, wanting students to think about the economic and political contexts of media and technology as systems that shape our lives. And so when we talk about issues of media ownership, our watchdogs want to know what, how do we help students understand the impact of global centralized media ownership as it affects um, the options and the choices we have in our media systems. But of course there's many motivations for doing this work, including being an activist to use the power of communication to make a difference in the world, to cultivate students' autonomy as independent learners to, who go where their creativity takes them, uh, and f in terms of the pleasure of using technology uh, because digital media technology and tools engage students more deeply in authentic learning. Or, this is close to the chocolate flavor, <laughs> being a demystifier. You want students to develop critical thinking skills by pulling back the curtain on how media is constructed. So with my friend Silke Graf and my colleague David Cooper Moore, we created a digital horoscope <laughs> quiz. And some of you even have received a, a button. Raise your hand if you have gotten one. So to find out whether you are indeed an activist, motivator, and trendsetter, you will need to go to the website and take a quiz. <laughs> we should give you some insight. But I'm absolutely convinced that some of what we fight about, argue about, and dispute is related to the most important question that we have, which is why are you doing this? Why does it matter to you? And that we have to have a pluralist perspective on that. We have to embrace all the motivations that people have for doing this work. Because some of us are doing it because we really want to improve elementary and secondary education. Because we think that's broken and it needs to be fixed. Some of us are here because we think we want to fix the media industry. Some of us want to make our cultures and societies more democratic. So we have lots of motives, including the spirit guide motive. There it is as a heart. We want to promote relational depth in how we use communication to understand ourselves and the people around us. So when asking this question, do we really need a global media literacy research community, we do because all those different motivations are needed in order for a movement to take root and grow. Now, that being said, You've spent two days listening and talking with people who have, who have very different approaches than you do. Very different. So with the person sitting next to you or in a small group of three, I want you to discuss these two questions. What are some of the most important differences that you have encountered between the way you're thinking about media literacy or media education and these other crazy people? And what are some important similarities that you have encountered. Okay, look around, find your partner. You have five minutes, go.
Okay, you have. Okay, let's hear from around the room. Let's start with the differences. Who would like to share one important difference that you have noticed, you're speaking very personally, about one important difference that you've noticed between your practice and other work you have encountered. Who would like to begin? I must hear from three of you, so someone must raise their hand. There are some important differences in our practice, like for example? I think um, I, I would make an argument that media contains the digital rather than being distinct from the digital. It doesn't actually make sense to me that it would be. I think uh, in that way to imagine digital literacies as outside or uh, somehow contesting media literacy is to misunderstand that media is always about mediums and digital is part of that in a sense. Very nice, thank you for sharing. Who's got another a difference? That, you've, that, that has been heightened or you have increased your awareness and appreciation of as a result of being in dialogue. Okay, something that struck me listening to people from a lot of different national contexts is that because media literacy is often actually about other things and actually because studying the media is often about studying the world around you and the world around you and particularly the state of democracy varies quite a lot depending on where you are and therefore the priorities of people varies a lot and that's really struck me listening to different people talking. Boy, I'm, I'm giving you the, 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 I can relate to that feeling, right? That there's lots of different cultural uh, phenomena about the way we do education, the way we do media, the way we do democracy that are shaping our discourse here. One more big difference that's interesting, useful, worth reflecting on as we come to our conclusion. Okay, I'm going to pick up on the big D, little d discourse stuff that emerged in a session earlier. And I, I, I'm intrigued by the big P, little p, politic, politicizing of where, where we are. The sense that there needs to be, and this probably follows on what you're saying, to a certain extent, that why do we need a consensus, a politically shaped consensus? We, we can get our hands dirty, engage with students around these questions of ideology, discourse, uh, politicisation. That's great. That's really good. Um, but do we really need to do, find consensus around big P? Where I'm going to maybe challenge you slightly is, the, and you were very clear about it. So it's actually, you know, there's no, there's no hidden anything. You, you're talking about democracy. Now, earlier we had a, a panel member, uh, I don't know if she's still here, who's, who's in, from Hong Kong, and we, we all got righteous about this. Oh my gosh, the people of Hong Kong need liberating with democracy. Let's fly, fly in and fix this shiz. But there's, you know, uh, is that our business? I don't, I'm not sure it is. So, so that's the core tension for, for, for me, is this big P, little P. Powerfully argued and indisputably a big part of the differences that were an undercurrent or an overcurrent in our conversation over the last two days. Now it's also the case that there are some powerful similarities and senses of connection that you experienced here in this marvelous conference. Who'd like to share one similarity that you know you're walking away with going, whoa, this other is connected deeply to my own passion, my own interests, my own work. Who'd like to share an important similarity? Um, I feel that um, people at least want to have some solutions. 
Yeah, because I've been to many other conferences all the time, and so um, I think uh, we talk about problems all the time, but at least here, everybody wants to do something to make a difference, and it is what touched me, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Two more people. What similarities were most meaningful to you as you encountered this diverse international community? Um, I think there's a consensus that we're all committed to the idea of critical engagement, whatever that may mean, and of course there may be differences contained therein. Very good. I, I feel that sense of connectedness as well. Uh, uh, for me, just the, all the questions around expertise, around the grown-ups having the expertise, and in, from my work particular, around curation and expertise, is very interesting. Fantastic. So I'm hoping that in this small conversation with your colleagues, you think more different, diff, you, you think more uh, as you leave this conference about the differences that are challenging us and the similarities that connect us. So today what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what I've observed at this conference that highlight the need for global innovation. Clearly, we're struggling with the shifting definitions of digital and media literacy. That's been a really important theme of this conference. And we are struggling with what to do about in responding to the new forms of media industry centralization. <coughs> and our stance and position in relation to that is essentially a, a, an unanswered question, I think, as we leave this conference. Um, it's indisputable that global tensions and competition uh, are part of the challenge we face, uh, not just in the European community, but uh, globally as well. And we all are encountering in our own sectors, and then when we come here, we realize, oh, everyone is experiencing the increased politicization of education, as we see that it isn't just about educators, the whole the whole, all our societies are struggling with how we understand this incredibly important function of socializing youth through the practices of teaching and learning, which are under a lot of potential threat as new, new technologies emerge. We're all trying to manage this relationship between learning in and out of school, and we're still wrestling with the uneven access to both the technology tools themselves and the competencies that surround them. That being said, I want to share with you something that we got to do last year at the lab that has really influenced my thinking and I am so grateful to all the visiting international scholars and graduate students who have spent time in the last uh, year or two uh, quite a, a wonderful list of folks, including your own Marquetta from the Czech Republic. We were delighted to host her. But in particular, these five scholars uh, have worked, we have worked together to try to do some cross-national analysis of what media literacy looks like in these five, in these five different contexts. Turkey, Israel, Russia, Brazil, and the United States. We asked this question, what can be learned through a cross-national comparison of media literacy in these five countries? And we've, we're working on a paper now, we've presented a, a couple of versions of this, I'm going to give you the very short version of it, and explain to you why I think some kind of approach to cross-national exploration is part of why we need a global research community like this. So here we are at the International Communication Association Conference in uh, Seattle, where we first presented this work. I'll go through quickly as I must, but you'll get the gist. So from our Russian colleague, Elizaveta Frazen, we understood that, in, that, that the challenges in Russia are that media literacy is conceptualized as protection against bad, i.e. Western media, that there's huge disparities in access to technology, and the national curriculum has a strong focus on the lecture tradition with a very strong focus on the teacher, uh, teacher authority. However, opportunities exist in Russia, including an active university research community, film clubs and youth film production traditions, which have a significant history in Russia, and access to digital technology does enable global conversations between educators and students. So last year, we took 
two of the, one of the challenges and one of the opportunities, and we did something very, very small. We held a teleconference with Russian educators in three cities and talked to them about media literacy. And it was an absolutely small but significant step. Why? Because what we learned was not what we came to learn. What we learned was so unexpected. The big aha for me was that when we prepared for this event, we called it Connecting Continents, and you can read more about it on the Media Education Lab website. What we learned about it was this. The big aha for the Russian teachers was that they didn't need to prepare written answers in advance of participating. <clears throat> that in fact, the teleconference was an opportunity for spontaneous conversation. I didn't know that spontaneous conversation would be such a distinct departure from the traditional approach to teacher education. So I wasn't expecting to learn that, but wow, what a powerful insight it was. So it turns out, and I, I really believe this, is that we have to be non-hierarchical about the concept of innovation. We have to stop competing with each other. Innovation in media literacy education is deeply situational and contextual. For the Russian media literacy educators, that teleconference, which would be totally routine in many other contexts, was a form of innovation that we have to respect and treasure and not put on a hierarchy, good, better, best. It was perfectly appropriately innovative for this particular context and situation and it becomes something to build upon and to treasure. So in Brazil, the challenges of media literacy in Brazil are that there's little tradition of interdisciplinary work, there's a huge disparity in access to technology, there's little focus on media and technology and teacher education, but there are some opportunities. Brazil has a strong tradition of innovation in literacy education, thanks to Paulo Freire. There is government financial support for technology. And there is a deep appreciation of the connections between formal and informal learning. So while in some kinds of innovation in Brazil are going to be impossible because of those big challenges, other forms of innovation are possible. So let me share with you how a colleague, um, um, uh, Carla Viana Cascarelli, created a really interesting project called Project, I don't speak Portuguese, pronounce. Very good, thank you so much. <laughs> she was aware that literacy educators in Brazil might want to teach about aspects of media culture, like for instance, memes, Right? But how to do it? So she provided very simple downloadable PDFs offering a little curriculum for a middle school or high school literacy educator who might want to jumpstart a dialogue about memes. It's just a PDF. It's an accessible technology for most literacy educators. For elementary school teachers, she created a simple downloadable for helping children to understand that reading includes reading the products that are in our cultural environment of consumer culture. And that there's a reading practice involved in reading the nutrition information, the imagery, the marketing. The, there's a lot of reading there for third graders to understand how to think critically about the, me the multimodal messages going on in the yogurt, right? <laughs> Simple, elegant, and appropriate to the culture and context. In Israel, in Israel, you think we have differences, <laughs> right? The media literacy community in Israel has oh, got many, many differences in their sense of purpose and goal for media literacy education. Religious diversity uh, contributes to the disparities. 
There's a gigantic lack of connection between the K-12 people and the researchers and the university scholars, both in education and in media studies, so there's divides all over the place. However, there are some great opportunities. Elective courses in media are normative in high schools. Media classes are, every high school has a media class. Venture capital and entrepreneurship money in ed, ed tech is plentiful. Israel is positioning itself as a center for innovation in uh, digital technology. And there is government financial support for innovation in the education, media, and technology sectors. And they're starting to appreciate the connections between formal and informal learning. So with a venture capital money and, and um, support from an NGO, they created this really cool project. Maybe people who live geographically right near each other, but because of religious divides, never encounter each other, maybe they could get to know each other through a combination of film and digital communication. Maybe some appreciation of cultural difference and some humanizing of the other could be possible using the power of film and the potential of digital and online communication. The project was called Arab Labor. It was a profoundly, intensively, technologically sophisticated effort, as you can see, right? With film clips and interactive media, and it was a colossal failure. As children said to their teachers, don't make us like those people. We don't want to like them. Turns out, I argue, that small-scale programs contribute to innovation even when they fail, if we share authentically with our knowledge community. I think one of the reasons why Julie and I are so keen on building a knowledge community through journals is we want to share more of our failures, right? And I would urge us to share more of our failures because I don't know about you, I learn more from failure than I learn from success. And I think the research community could be very nobly built as we start to be authentically sharing what doesn't work just as much as we share what does work. Now in the United States we have similar challenges and opportunities when it comes to digital and media literacy. We have divergent definitions, obviously. We have local control of schools, which leads to significant disparities. When I first came to my first international gathering in 1989, and then of course when I met the Europeans in the, in the 1990s, I was so jealous. Man have a Ministry of Education that's responsible for the whole curriculum. So like if you got to the ministry, you could bring media literacy to the whole country in one fell swoop. I have to go one, district by district by district by district, 15,000 local schools, each with their own agenda. No central curriculum. I thought I had a tough job and you guys had it easy. <laughs> Turns out, that local control of schools leads to disparities, it's both an opportunity and a challenge. It's an opportunity because it's likely that I can get some school district to <laughs> let me in. <laughs> However, look at our other opportunities that we've been able to build on. We have a very robust tradition of having non-teachers in the building like librarians and technology specialists. Raise your hand if that is a tradition in your country, that you have librarians and technology specialists. Look around the room. Gosh, not very many of us have these other people who can help us, but we do. Aren't we lucky? We have some venture capital and entrepreneurship money in ed tech, like no tomorrow. Uh, we have some appreciation between formal and informal learning. And we have a market economy for professional development, which means that anybody can hang up a shingle and say, I'm going to teach teachers how to do something, <laughs> right? And there's a market economy and, the, and there's, there's money to be made in that business. So that's real opportunity. So that led us to figure out how could we work with English 
with the teachers who are teaching English as a second language. Of course, because we are a nation of immigrants, every year we have children and young people coming to the United States brand new from hundreds of different countries. They, they show up in our public schools and now we must, they must learn English and maybe chemistry and biology and literature and everything else. So we worked in Philadelphia with a group of high school students aged 14 to 19 with my colleague uh, Wen Xu from Ningxia University in Western China, Michael Rob Greco from Temple University. We used these research methods, uh, classroom observation, interviews with teachers, analysis of student work samples. We just published this. It's in the TESOL uh, journal. Six weeks of a teacher action research project designed to explore how media literacy pedagogy could be used with brand new immigrants children with very low English language skills, how could we support their English language learning and introduce media literacy? Ha! How much fun it was. So, we did advertising analysis. Here's an ad that says, whose hand are you holding? It's for a hand sanitizer product, <laughs> right? And you can see the, the many hands <laughs> that you might be encountering, right, <laughs> if you were taking the bus. And among other activities, children practice their vocabulary skills by using the close reading technique. So will you take a look at the words we're trying to learn? Magazine, audience, context, collaborated purpose, targets, message, attention, technique, company, differently represents, persuade, lifestyle. I will read the sentence and you will shout out the correct answer, okay? Ready? The Dettol. made this ad for a hand sanitizer. The authors are the company and the ad, and the ad, targets that they pay, and the ad, hmm, they, uh-oh, this isn't working. <laughs> That's what happens when you make a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> you try to make it interactive and it's, ooh, so, yeah. <laughs> Very good. I think I might have shortened my list of uh, vocabulary words just to fit in the page, so I apologize for that. You get the concept, right? The idea is we might practice our vocabulary learning um, in this way. By at six weeks, after six weeks, with the help of Google Translator, a very powerful tool for ESL learning, Students were able to select their own ad, in this case it was an insurance company ad, and able to analyze the authors and audiences, the messages and meanings, and the representation and reality. So under representation and reality, ad, uh, Nan writes, the students every day take the bus, so they don't need this message. So high school students are not the target audience of a car insurance ad. The company help us save Help us to save how much money we could enjoy a multi-policy discount when you insure more than one type of vehicle. Okay, it's a sentence, it has a subject, and it's a verb, and she's wrapping her head around what the meaning of this ad is about. And um, for a brand new uh, uh, English language learner, it's uh, uh, pretty impressive. They also got a chance to use a wiki and participate in creating something that lives online. All right. Next up, my, my time is short, Turkey. Challenges and opportunities in Turkey. The national curriculum is teacher-centered, lecture-driven. There's a big disconnect between the research and the K-12 community. There's no tradition of continuing education for teachers. There's a substantial divide between the center and the periphery in terms of uh, access to resources. And of course, there's not enough tur digital Turkish content, right? However, there's a lot of opportunities. There's a gigantic youth culture. Most teachers in Turkey are under age 30, right? So youth culture is really important and, and a young teaching uh, faculty is a, a real opportunity. There's a gigantic growth of private schools and that creates some pressure for innovation. There's government funding for technology, the famous FATE program, which has put laptops in hundreds of Turkish elementary and secondary schools and there are ICT courses and media literacy electives in middle school. Last year, 330,000 seventh graders 
took a media literacy elective in Turkey. Wow. So, what we wondered about was, could we create a global partnership between our two universities and two schools? And so with middle school children in California and the United States, we did a research inquiry. We were trying to figure out what a collaborative approach to media literacy would look like between our two countries. We used interviews with teachers, analysis of student work samples, classroom observations. Saeed Tuzel and I presented this at the International Association for Intercultural Communication Research this summer, and we're working on uh, publishing it now. There we are in California, there we are in Turkey, and here are our three teaching partners. An ICT teacher, a media literacy teacher, and a California social studies teacher. So collaborating two middle school electives in Turkey and a middle school in California. We call the project Connections. Turkey and California communication, eliminate cultural stereotypes. Here are a picture, these are, these are the kids in California. These are the kids in Turkey. Five simple activities. We used five hours of time, five hours of time over the course of a semester. First step, using a closed social network, a Ning, we had a getting to know you experience, children, actually just talked to each other. Hi, I'm Zainab, I'm 13 years old. I live in Akanakala. I like drinking tea with my family members. We sit and talk about everything. I like playing volleyball. And I believe if the war finish, this world will be more peaceful than now. Hi Zainab, I like drinking tea. Also, I completely agree that if war stopped, the world will be a more peaceful place. Was there a specific war that you were referring to? <laughs> it's in the United States. We're involved in two or three, right? So which war are you talking about? And he's like, oh no, I, I, I'm talking to Jonah, right? Okay, so they just chat. <laughs> then they do the classic, what do we know? What do we want to learn? What do we learn? And what do we find out? That the kids in the United States don't know anything about Turkey, nothing. In fact, they're pretty convinced that Turkey is just like terrorists. Right? They're not even sure where is Turkey, but they know there are terrorists there, right? And it turns out that the Turkish kids are delighted to correct the American kids' misunderstanding, especially about things like Bosporus. Bosporus is the best thing of Istanbul. What's Bosporus, says Samantha? Here is a link about the Bosporus. This is a seventh grader spontaneously sharing. That's access, spontaneously sharing information. And then there's a photo. So kids are curating images and ideas to share with each other. The teacher's not the center of the equation. The teacher's not guiding the learning. The children are co-constructing the learning experience. Now, because American students lack huge amounts of knowledge about Turkish history, life, and culture, the American kids are at a disadvantage. And these are very privileged kids who haven't been at a disadvantage very much. Their parents are the children of Google executives. This is a private school. And they're discovering for the first time that they're not in the power position. In fact, they're discovering that Turkish students have more information about the United States than they do and so when we do a word cloud, we discover the Turkish kids know all kinds of things about Justin Timberlake and Justin Bieber and American football and the White House and lots and lots of things, including the CIA, <laughs> right? So the teachers decide that it might be a good idea to have kids think about the representation of teachers in the media. This is a topic about which Turkish seventh graders and American seventh graders have a lot of knowledge. So the children are asked to compare and contrast two TV shows. They give, they're given a five minute excerpt of two TV shows, both of which depict high school 
And they're asked to comment and analyze. Here's the first one they're asked to analyze. She is right outside. Yes, good. Let's have a little talk with her. Carly, get in here right now. Have a seat. So, I understand you put some flyers up all over the school. Yes, I did. Punk! Miss Briggs! <laughs> I'm Carly. Carly, this is flyer. <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's a... It's not funny! Why would you photo dock my head onto the body of a rhinoceros? Oh, I... Rhinoceros? Oh, no, no, no. She made you a hippopotamus. No, no, she's a rhinoceros. A hippo has fatter thighs and a wider snout. I thought the rhinos had fat thighs. No, the picture of the two of them together. Is it? Really oh, is it? Oh, it doesn't matter! <laughs> Okay, you got it? We, we have, what we have here is a representation of how a school is handling the issue of a kind of cyber bullying, where the student has put up a, an offensive photo and now is experiencing some consequences. And you can see how humorously this incident of cyber bullying is represented in the media. So now we see an example from a Turkish show uh, featuring High school students. Eventually, they do get into the school. Sooner or later, there are a few shots of classroom activity. Um, so here's the children's dialogue. Um, Alex says, I thought the clip from iCarly was not very realistic for very many reasons. First of all, the principal and his assistant would not act so unprofessional. Principal Fra Franklin did not seem like an authority figure, right? And Sen Golsom uh, observes, uh, that that disrespect is actually represented in both media. Both media show 
uh, students, high school students, acting disrespectfully to teachers, even though that is not normative in children's experience. So they have a robust dialogue around what the ethical dimensions of representing high school life are in, this, in these two forms of entertainment. And students clearly recognize how values are re misrepresented in entertainment media for their own culture, but they have no choice but to see the foreign example as accurate. So there is this powerful aha as the kids realize, oh, there's misrepresentation going on of sorts in both uh, 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 forms. So because of this experiment, I am absolutely uh, convinced at this, at, at this dimension of media literacy that obviously seems important to people in, in this uh, room, the idea that issues of representation and focus on popular culture activate critical thinking about personal and social identity in relation to culture and values. And for children, that is a big aha. It's a very meaningful experience. Kids perceived it to be very meaningful. When we moved on to talk about current events, it was when the Ukraine was uh, uh, dealing with the crisis in, in, their, um, in their change of government. The kids were, had a lot of questions, right? They concluded this activity by exchanging videos about daily life. As the California kids made a five minute video, here's the way we really live. And the Turkish kids made a five minute video, here's the way we really live. We were asking the question, what can students learn in different countries around the world, learn from each other using online multimedia communication? Of course, a lot of feeling of social and emotional connectedness as embodied by Omur. I love American people because they are sincere. <laughs> oh. So look at this. I learned a lot about culture, stereotypes, and online communication. I've learned a lot more than I used to about the Turkish culture. For example, your dedication towards school. Before, I did not know very much about Turkey. I didn't know what to expect. When I was getting to know you guys, I noticed an ongoing theme of great commitment to school. Right? Then we investigated stereotypes, right? And so this, both children had, both groups of children had a lot of uh, 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 insight in getting a chance to encounter media stereotypes about school and confront them. So obviously I'm, 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 I think we're all aware of how global partnerships can provoke, promote innovation to advance new knowledge in the theme. What we learned and what the research story is behind this example is we learned that students in neither one of these schools had ever had an experience of bringing popular culture in as an artifact for analysis. This was a novel task. So this was new to both of these communities. And students can identify cultural values in the representation of school, but they can't identify misrepresentation across culture. That's not surprising. However, when it came to discussing current events, Turkish students were not comfortable talking about the current political situation in their country, and American students could not appreciate their reticence. So we, had, we exposed a gap, right, where American kids didn't understand why Turkish kids didn't want to talk about their political situation, and it became a kind of a place of inquiry, right? And so there was a lot of discussion about fear, about self-censorship, about uncertainty. Even in the clip we see, the secret police, the school police circling the building, these are not things that American children understand or can make sense of, so there was a, a gap that we didn't know would be important that got revealed through the different levels of comfort in talking about current events. And of course, this gigantic area of uh, curiosity and inquiry for me, awareness of power knowledge gaps, as American students gained a new awareness of the global power imbalances as they confront their own lack of access to global popular culture. Because although we are the world's leading exporter of entertainment culture, we import nothing or very little. So. We are, Americans are at a profound disadvantage in cultural understanding because we get no global media. And that was a big aha, not just for the seventh graders, but for the teachers in the school as well. 
So what can be learned by cross-national comparison of media literacy initiatives? I don't know about you, but I think these are new concepts that we have to really embrace and reflect on. And the first one is relationships. Relationships. Relationships need to be part of our media literacy dialogue, right? Because through personal relationships develops the trust and respect that is required for us to have authentic sharing. And collaboration requires taking risks. And so can we, if we have trusting relationships, can we take risks to discover new approaches to collaboration? And can we bring the values word back into our community? I hope so. Because through media literacy education, it's possible to appreciate opportunities and challenges around how values is part of our media systems, our education system, and our own motivation to do this work. And I think the concept of reflection and action is super, super important as we think, I'd like us to think more deeply and more theoretically about the implications of these two practices as embodied within media literacy pedagogy. Uh, analyzing our own attitudes and challenging assumptions and stereotypes and working together to combat inequity, prejudice, and discrimination. So why do we need a global media literacy education? Because maybe these new concepts are a place of uh, opportunity for us to deepen our connection to the larger stakeholders around us. So today I've, I've shared with you my belief that innovation in media literacy is deeply situational and contextual, that small scale programs contribute to innovation when we share with a larger knowledge community, that issues of representation and a focus on popular culture activate critical thinking in, about personal and social identity in ways that help us understand media's, media and education's um, systemic uh, connection to culture and values, and the global, uh, it, global partnerships should be more than just comparing numbers between countries. The global partnerships need to be truly built on relationships that allow us to try new things and take risks with each other and with our colleagues. So that's only going to happen if we embrace these new approaches and these new stakeholders if we recognize that the practices that I just described to you are blurry as all hell. They embrace all of these conceptualizations, all these flavors making a kind of ice cream sundae, <laughs> right? As internet safety issues get discussed when we talk about the ethics of cyberbullying, as media literacy and the issues of representation get explored, as we use Ning and social network to engage with each other in a multimodal way, as kids make media to represent their own culture, and as they use and activate ICT skills. So this beautiful process of literacy is really what we're all about. And we should be really grateful that so many stakeholders are joining us. And we don't need to be afraid of them. And we don't need to carve out our, our territory. We need to embrace our multiple stakeholders. I propose to you that if we think deeply about our shared motivation and what really draws us together, it's something that, Igor, you said very beautifully in your session. You said, media literacy is a movement. And although we may have different motives for what we want media literacy to accomplish, we know that through using the power of information and communication, we can make a difference in the world. Thank you very much.